The story begins with a narration that tells us how the hero who defeated the demon lord is now respected as a god in this world. Today, the holy sisters are offering their prayers to him, and it looks like they are very sincere in their requests. Of course, these holy sisters are shown to be cute and curvy babes as well, so they might be praying for some other things as well. Later on, at the church we see two of the holy girls cowering in fear as a goblin seemingly approaches them. They beg it not to come any closer and pray to the hero, known as Taka to come and save them. However, it turns out that the third holy girl is actually holding the goblin as her hostage and is showing off its elephant to the other two girls. She teases them by saying this is something they wanted to see all this time, but they tell her to keep that thing away from them. One of the holy sisters says that she is fine seeing the goblin's elephant since she is an adult. But this is obviously a lie because she is scared out of her brains to see such a horrid sight. In the middle of all this, the real hero of the story enters the church and is shocked by the display that is going on in front of him. His name is Scott, and he is a rookie priest who most definitely did not expect to see holy girls playing around with a goblin and his elephant. He has never witnessed anything as unholy as this, so he calls out to the girls hoping to understand what is going on. However, the person who reacts first is none other than the goblin who calls out to Scott for help. This is indeed unheard of before as a monster never asks a human for help. Now that the girls have been found out, they call out to Scott as father and ask him to save them from the beast. Of course, this is nothing more than a blatant lie and Scott allows it for now because he has just gotten here. The girls say all kinds of things to him, such as the goblin being a creep and having a small elephant. They also say shady things such as the beast having a superfluous vigor and the ability to release water multiple times through his trunk. Scott can only comment on the state of things in this seemingly unholy church, and then the main culprit tells him that she and the others are just weak sisters. With that, she opens the mouth of the goblin, and in a shocking display, the holy sister vomits into his mouth. This is uncalled for, and Scott really does not know how to react to this. The goblin on the other hand, is as good as dead with no energy left to take the torture. Now, the brunette sister named Calm apologizes to Scott for showing him such an indecent sight. She reasons that the puking sister ended up having way too much to drink. But even so, she is a sister of the church, so she should be excused. Calm then asks Scott what brings him here today, and he says that he himself has come late to the church. It turns out that he has been assigned to the parish, and he is here to supervise the three unholy sisters. Calm does not understand this, because it means that Scott will be living together with the sisters. Our hero tells the holy sister that he has received a message from above to live with her and the two other sisters. Calm gets very excited over the prospect of living together with a young man, and it awakens all kinds of intrusive thoughts in her mind. She even begins to have fantasies about our hero, and refers to him as father, but not in a holy way. Scott asks her if all is well, so she recollects herself and begins to talk like an actual nun. Calm wonders if it would be appropriate for a man to live with three holy sisters. But then she is interrupted by the smallest sister named Bloomera. She says that Calm is being too stuffy, and she should not have a problem with such things if she is an adult woman. Such girls need to be more relaxed in the presence of a man. And then she says that it's no big deal to have Scott in the church. Our hero is glad to hear this and thinks of Bloomera as a nice girl. She also says that the manual labor work can be given to Father Scott and from what she knows. A lot of these priests have other shady preferences. If that is the case, then the girls will not have to worry about getting attacked by Scott. Of course, that is just a huge misconception. But there's nothing our hero can do to change their minds. He does not understand what is wrong with these holy sisters, and even wonders if he has come to the wrong church. But he simply tells them that they have unique personalities. Now, we see the culprit sister who is drinking again and we learn that she is actually an ogre named Med. Calm tells Scott that the faith of Taka allows a broad variety of races to come and worship him. As a matter of fact, 
even sinners are allowed to worship Taka. And Kalm refers to Med as an example of it, as she has still not stopped drinking. That is when Med tells Scott that he should be knowing something very important about this church. It is basically a dumping ground for sisters who have caused problems in actual holy churches. It doesn't take our hero long before realizing that Med has alcohol problems. But she says that the charges against her are false, as she has not done a single bad thing. As expected, our hero has his task cut out for him, as he needs to manage a church filled with unholy sisters. He had thought that he could spread the teachings of the hero Taka with them. But it is not looking possible with the way these girls behave. He goes through his contract again, as he believes something must have gone wrong, when he was given the holy order. He had been praying to God earnestly, so for him to be given such sinful girls has to be a mistake. In a hilarious twist, our hero realizes that he has been tricked by the holy order, as the church name in his contract is indeed correct. However, there is some fine text that can't be read properly unless you focus on it. Upon reading this text, Scott learns that the sins of these unholy sisters were indeed mentioned. And the reason he was assigned here was because he used to be an adventurer. The other priests hoped that Scott would be able to handle Calm, Bloomer, and Med, because if anyone can do it, it's him. Our hero is ashamed of himself for not reading through the terms and conditions of his agreement, and he curses himself for not paying close attention. Of course, since he used to be an adventurer, it looks like he has quite the foul mouth himself. Now, it all starts to make sense to Scott because for a priest to be living with three cute and curvy babes was unheard of in the holy church. He considers lodging a complaint, but wonders if he will even be able to do such a thing. As Scott wonders what to do, Calm tells him that she understands the girls are unclean. She gets it because the three of them are all tainted by sin. If Scott does not wish to stay here, then he is free to leave and move on. Calm states that she and the other girls will continue to atone for their sins by living here. Med points to the exit, but pukes a bit more while saying this, so she is told to control herself. This leads Scott to have a change of heart, and then he offers his hand to the girls, much to their surprise. He says that they are not impure at all, and they simply need some guidance to repent for their sins. He wants to help them achieve that and he asks if they will allow him to do so. Our hero goes on to say that the Taka faith welcomes everyone, whether they are family, neighbors, or even sinners. Everyone deserves love as per the teachings of this faith. And Scott says that he himself has been guilty of having intrusive thoughts. Keeping this in mind, he would like the girls to give him a chance to repent for his sins as well. He wishes to live together with the unholy sisters, and this leads Bloomera to ask if he's trying to say he loves her. This is obviously not the case, and the sisters ask our hero if he will judge them for their sins. He says he most definitely will not do such a thing. So Calm asks if he will call her impure. He says no, and then Med asks if he will ask about what sins the girls have committed as nuns. He says no to that as well and states that the unholy sisters can always come to him for advice if they want. Scott is ready to be their lord and savior, so the girls thank him for his support and welcome him into the church. Now, we move to the night time and see Scott busy with a lot of books at his table. He was worried about how things would turn out at first, but it looks like everyone will get along just fine now. He still does not get why the girls were doing shady things to a goblin, but he manages to convince himself that it must be some kind of odd custom around here. He does not want to think too deeply about such things because tomorrow is a new day. However, as he tries to sleep, Scott can hear some rustling, and it happens to be the unholy sisters having a discussion. They might have been waiting for Scott to fall asleep, and Calm tries to stop the other two. But her efforts are in vain as Bloomera and Med break into our hero's room. They wake him up and put on his glasses after which Scott is held as a hostage by the unholy sisters. He does not understand what is going on, so Bloomer explains that they are only acting this way because of what he said earlier about helping them with advice. She states that she would like to see his elephant, 
because it is the best way for her to become an adult woman. Of course, Scott has no intention of doing this. And then we learn that Bloomer's sin was that of spreading lies. It turns out that she was trying to frame a handsome priest at her previous church, even though she only had one conversation with him. This led people to believe that the priest was like Drake, so they expelled Bloomera from the church and brought her here. If this was not bad enough, then Med reveals that she was actually trying to have fun with the goblin's elephant as a form of education for Bloomera. Scott can't believe this. And then we learn that Med's sin was drunken rampage. Basically, during a festival, Med had gotten way too drunk and went berserk with all the priests of a monastery by acting on her intrusive thoughts. The worst though is Calm, whose race is revealed to be that of a succubus. She says that she does not have any shady intentions, but her behavior is showing something completely different. Calm's sins are actually the worst of them all because they were the unleashing of her carnal desires. It turns out that she had tried to abstain from her intrusive thoughts for a while but eventually gave in to her succubus hormones and wreaked havoc in a monastery that is so shady that it can't even be spoken of. Scott can't believe this, and he asks the girls to stop playing around with him, but it does not look like they are going to do that. They want to make him feel good, and Bloomera is particularly keen on proving that she is an adult woman. As the girls proceed to engage in shady acts with our hero, he can feel his intrusive thoughts kicking in but he fights with all his might in order to endure the temptation. Scott remembers that he used to dabble in many reckless acts back when he used to be an adventurer. However, he was saved due to the teachings of the hero Taka and his faith. This is the start of his new life, so he must not commit any acts of indiscretion. However, he can't control his elephant any longer, and it decides to unleash his trunk in front of the unholy sisters. They are amazed to see such a massive trunk, and they pray to it, as if it is a blessing from their Holy Father. Scott, on the other hand, prays for forgiveness as he has given in to his intrusive thoughts yet again. The girls exclaim upon the sight of Scott's elephant, and he laments the fact that he is also a sinner just like them. Meanwhile, the goblin from earlier sees his chance to escape this twisted church and run for his life. With this, our hero has begun a rather interesting life with a bunch of interesting girls. The next morning, Scott reminds us that he is an unworthy priest, but has still been asked to head the Karma Church. He wakes up feeling fresh and realizes that it is the seventh day of the week, which means that it's time for the seventh worship. Scott need to get ready after breakfast, but he realizes that his elephant has risen early in the morning. Of course, the unholy sisters are ready to pounce on this opportunity, as they are worshipping Scott's elephant like their new god. Med is glad that men have such a phenomenon in the mornings, and she explains this to Bloomera, who says that she knows this much due to her having touched one before. Meanwhile, Calm is fast asleep and having a whole range of shady fantasies about our hero and her in the morning. Scott can't take so much sin right off the bat, so he decides to tell us a bit about the seventh worship. Basically, this is that time of the week when people gather together to pray and reaffirm their faith in the hero God. Scott gets ready for the session, and he has the unholy sisters assist him as well, although Med can't seem to stop her drinking. What's worse is the fact that the church is completely empty, and it doesn't look like anyone will be coming here either. Scott asks if there are any believers around here, but then Calm explains that this could be because she was the one officiating as a proxy until now. The Taka faith does allow women to host such sessions after all, but if it's a succubus like Calm, then it's only expected for nobody to turn up. On top of that, the church has not been given any donations either, which is why it looks fairly run down now. Scott can't bear to see this, as he has not even greeted any of the villagers yet. He decides to head off into town and greet everyone, so he tells the nun girls to get ready as well. This makes the unholy sisters upset, especially Bloomera, who was looking forward to the reading of a shady novel. Scott realizes that the nun girls would read this shady novel during the seventh worship instead of the actual holy scriptures, 
which is probably why the people of the village have no interest in coming here any longer. Now, our hero heads into the Karma village and starts to greet all the residents. He introduces himself as a priest and explains that he has been appointed at the Karma church. He hopes to begin on a good note with the villagers, but then the unholy sisters show up behind him and it causes the local folks to become extremely hostile. As a matter of fact, they almost turn into demons when Scott asks them to join him for the seventh worship. It doesn't take long for the entire village to turn into a mob and start attacking our hero without even considering that he may not be like the unholy sisters. The residents have gone berserk and they keep yelling sister, probably because they don't like either of Calm, Bloomera, or Med. Scott hides behind one of the houses with the unholy sisters and he asks them what they've done to the people here. Calm nervously says they're completely innocent, but it does not seem that way at all. The villagers can hear the group's voices, so they move in closer to Scott, and he worries for what might happen to him after he gets caught. In order to save their holy father, the nun girls offer him a solution, but not a holy one. Scott says that they can't do such a thing in broad daylight, but the girls say that it is all fine because no one will come and disturb them. The girls continue to make shady noises with Scott, and the villagers think of it to be some couple engaging in unspeakable acts. Our hero can't believe that he and the girls are able to fool the villagers with such a simple act, and it looks like Calm's shady novel has come in handy after all. Now, the succubus girl explains that she and the nun girls had actually come to this village before to greet everyone. However, they found that the people over here were not the type to take part in worship. Even so, they had managed to spread good word about the Taka faith, and it also helped that they were cute and curvy. This had convinced some of the villagers to give the faith a shot. But then the unholy sisters tried to collect donations in exchange for a pot of good fortune. Despite all the resistance they faced at first, the unholy sisters did manage to crack a sale and it was the village chief who even proudly displayed the pot at his home. Due to this, the villagers decided to throw a party for the nun girls, but this did not turn out the way they would have expected. At first, the unholy sisters were being welcomed as normal people, but then Med started to get drunk, and even Calm was losing her sense of morals. The men of the village took a particular liking towards the succubus girl, and she could not help herself after a certain point. Since Bloomera was already asleep at the time, Calm had no reason to hold herself back against so many men, and she ended up releasing way too many of her pheromones. This caused another kind of shady festival to start while Calm and Med watched on in horror and disbelief. That night is now referred to as indiscriminate terror, and Scott fully agrees with that term. Med says that the people of this village treat people of the Taka faith like heretics, so the best option right now would be to go home. Since they have distracted the villagers, it's easy to leave, but Scott decides to stay because he believes it's his duty to repair the good name of the Taka faith. Our hero is sure that all will be well if they just face the villagers up front. But this was clearly a bad idea as he eventually gets tied to a cross as if he is going to start a whole new religion. The unholy sisters watch from a distance and comment that their new holy father is too much of a straight lace. Calm wonders if they should head back, but Bloomer says that they can't just leave Scott alone like this. After all, they are the reason the villagers have beaten him up in the first place, and the only reason Scott is in pain right now is because he is trying to rectify their sins. Bloomer is a bit confused as to what they should do, because nobody is willing to listen to Scott. The nun girls decide to bring in their own crowd now, and they go to our hero with the new recruits. They introduce their members, but they don't like the type to pray religiously at all. Some of them are kids who have only come because of Bloomer's promise to give them candy. Calm has brought some really old people because her succubus hormones don't work on such people. And finally, Med has also brought some people, but they all happen to be goblins that happen to be hiding from her in the forest. Calm tells her that she should have at least gotten a species they can communicate with, but it's too late for that now. Anyway, the nun girls show up with their followers in front of Scott, 
and apologize to him for being no good. However, he bows down to them and thanks the girls for all their efforts. The girls don't get this because they have brought people who aren't exactly known for worshipping the Taka faith. With the goblins around, they don't even have the right species for the job. But that does not matter to our hero. To him, the fact that the unholy sisters took action for his sake was more than enough. And it proves that they all possess the noble spirit. Bloomera is glad to hear this. So she asks her holy father if she is a fine adult woman. He agrees with her and even calls her a charming young lady. With that, Scott would like to start with the worship, but he does not realize that he has made Bloomera blush with love. Now, the kids, the elderly, and the goblins are seated, even though the procession will not happen with a hymn. Scott is fine with this, as he simply wishes to begin his worship under the blue sky. Our hero begins his holy speech by talking about the Bishop of Parchica, who has now become a priest. He is essentially referring to himself, and then he chants a holy prayer to bless all of those in attendance. The kids ask Scott for the candy, and he promises to give it to them once the worship is over. Bloomera continues to gaze upon Scott, and then she turns to Kalma and Med. She comments on how people have always scolded her for not acting her age and being strange, but Scott called her a wonderful woman. Yesterday, he also said that he loved her, and these words make the other unholy sisters happy. However, Bloomera seems to have taken this the wrong way and thinks of our hero as someone who really loves her. This makes her extremely excited, and she wants to have a shady relationship with her holy father. Kalm reminds Bloomera of what she had done to end up in this place, and if things will continue as they are, then Scott will get kicked out before he can do anything about the church. Bloomera must not repeat the same mistake twice, but it looks like our hero's chastity is going to be under threat again. Now, in order to understand Bloomera's story, we need to go back in time for a bit where a narration talks about the untold past of a certain holy sister. She had gotten close to a handsome young priest who had come for worship, but clearly took it the wrong way. Another sister had asked this girl about the vibe she shared with the priest, and she said that the Holy Father was having an unholy relationship with her. Of course, she was just trying to show off, but she did not understand the implications of her statement. As expected, the priest in question was banished from the church under the suspicion of being a lowly con. Of course, it goes without saying that the girl in question is Bloomera, and she needs to learn the art of keeping quiet. Anyway, since the hero from another world named Taka has been spreading his teachings to everyone from this world, it can be imparted to anyone regardless of their sins. Now, we learn that this narration is actually being done by our current hero Scott, who is running through the history of Taka and his religion of Taka Fumism. He is teaching the little kids who had come here under the promise of candy, and they seem interested enough. This is good news for Scott, because if the kids can take this attitude with them to the village, then they can help clear the misconceptions about the Karma Church. However, Scott needs to be a bit more realistic in his approach, because the moment Med shows up with the cookies, the kids rush towards them and say that putting up with a boring speech was well worth the effort. Scott still consoles himself by saying the kids may probably need some more time to understand the importance of this religion. Now, he is offered a whole pack of cookies from Bloomera, but she is dressed differently and acts quite strange around him. She kisses the pack of cookies and tells Scott that she has filled it with her love, so she would like him to eat it all up. Scott does not understand why she is behaving this way. And then we learned that our hero had helped Bloomer repent her sins the previous night. Of course, this was just him doing his duty as a holy father, but Bloomer seems to have mistaken it for affection. She feels that she and Scott are bound by fate, but the unholy sisters tell her to get a hold of herself. After all, a nun girl like Bloomer should not be falling in love so casually. However, she says that she is not playing any games and has actually fallen in love after giving it a lot of thought. Med is busy getting drunk in the background, so Kalm tells her that it is not acceptable either way. The succubus explains that their bodies belong to God because they are his slaves. 
The same logic applies to the hero Taka. So the unholy sisters can only take him and God as their true lovers. Med cuts her off by saying now she knows why Kalm has named her shady toy Taka, and this obviously scares her. Kalm wants to know how Med is aware of such a thing, but the ogre girl says that she can hear all her intrusive noises coming from the next room. Bloomera is not paying attention to any of this, and she says that her grown-up charm may have been a bit too stimulating for our hero. After all, Scott can only be a holy father if he has not engaged in unholy acts with cute and curvy babes. Bloomera is on a completely different tangent as she thinks about using a motherly embrace the next time she meets with Scott. In the middle of her tomfoolery, we see a mystical unicorn showing up, and it's called Yu-Chan. Bloomera is quite fond of the unicorn, so she hugs him and asks what's wrong. This is because it's been a while since Yu Chan has come out of the forest. And then we learn that unicorns are mythical creatures in this world as well. They rarely appear in front of humans, but it looks like they are fond of those who have not been touched or tainted. The children decide to leave now, so Scott asks the unholy sisters if they would like to have some tea. Bloomera seems to have already prepared it, so Scott thanks her for the effort but he can only see three cups over here. It's now when things get really weird as Bloomera takes out a baby bottle and offers it to our hero. This is her idea of giving him motherly affection, and it is clearly wrong as she tries to force Scott to consume milk from the baby bottle. Our hero tries to resist it at first, but when he learns what kind of milk is inside the baby bottle, he immediately drinks it. Bloomera asks him if her milk is tasty, and he says yes without a doubt. Med laughs at what she is seeing, while Calm is shocked to see the Holy Father drinking such unholy milk. Now, Bloomera says that she will feed the cookies to Scott as well, and he tries to resist her, even though he clearly wants her to feed him. Now, Bloomera says that there is no need for him to hold back, but she strangely chews the cookies in her own mouth first. Then she proceeds to try and feed the cookies to our hero as if he is some kind of bird baby. Bloomera had once read that feeding by the mouth is the best way to establish love between two people, but Scott tries his best to hold her off. His own intrusive thoughts may kick in soon enough, so the others tell them to knock it off. Calm has realized that Bloomera clearly has the wrong idea when it comes to motherhood, so she should not be trusted at all. As the succubus girl tries to calm down Bloomera, Scott tells Med that the naughty girl is very odd. However, the drunk sister reveals that Bloomera has a crush on Scott and might as well be in love with him. Our hero can't believe this, but Med says it's the truth. It finally hits Scott that Bloomera loves him, but he is not able to come to terms with this fact, probably because he is also like Drake. Now, Scott asks Bloomera a question which is regarding her shady desires. He wants to know if she would like romance in her life to become an adult, and she tries to answer with confidence but pauses. Bloomera is confused by this question, and then Scott explains that wanting romance might be a good thing, but she should remember that she has devoted herself to God and Taka. Our hero goes on to explain how the naughty girl should not be using romance as a way to become an adult. After all, since it is a means to toy with the emotions of others, Romance is not a shortcut to becoming an adult. This leads Bloomera to fall silent, and the other two unholy sisters are amazed to see how Scott knew right away what the naughty girl was thinking this whole time. This gives our hero the chance to mention how Bloomera does not know the difference between trying too hard and actually being grown up. This is why she is always trying to show off her adult self whenever she gets the chance. At the same time, these are things that almost everyone does while growing up, so it would not be fair to poke fun at Bloomera for it. Med also remembers something like this from her childhood, although it involved Alabama-level activities with her own dad. This was because she would see her own mom doing it with her dad, which was why she thought it was a fun game. Luckily, nothing actually happened because her parents would dismiss her requests. Even Calm would have some shady fantasies of her own, but these intrusive thoughts seem to be a bit too much, so the unholy sisters need to take it down a notch. 
Scott maintains that it still might take some time for Bloomera to understand his advice. So he would like to keep an eye on her along with Med and Count. Both the unholy sisters are fine with this, and even Yu Chan feels like he can entrust Bloomera's chastity to our hero. This has come as a bit of a surprise to Scott, because he did not expect to see a talking unicorn in the middle of the forest. He asks the unholy sisters what's the deal with Yu Chan, but they tell him it's best to leave the matter alone. Later at night, Bloomera is seen praying to God and Taka at night, because she must repent for what she has done. The naughty girl has realized that she was trying to use romance as a shortcut and was about to toy with someone's emotions. Luckily, she has realized her mistake, thanks to our hero. She then prays to God and Taka after which she swears that she will never fall in love again while also becoming an adult. However, this is not going where we all thought this was going. Bloomera ends up on top of our hero at night and says that she will turn into an adult by becoming the mother to Scott's child. What follows is a series of unspeakable acts, and the reason Bloomera is doing this is because she had read somewhere that this is how people make Of course, even though what she is doing is very shady, it is still not the right way to have a child. She maintains that she will continue to love our hero even harder because of how much he thinks about her. With that, she wishes Scott a good night and then she goes off to sleep. The next morning is a completely different story, as a woman is heard screaming in bed. It is none other than Med, and she kicks Scott off the bed because the both of them happen to be in it at the same time. She does not know why this has happened, and even Scott wonders how he has found himself in such a situation. Before we figure this out, we need to learn a bit about the drunk sister's regretful past. In a certain monastery, there used to be a very prim and proper ogre sister who would spend her days there completely sober. One fine day, there was a celebration happening at the village due to a festival. During this time, even the sisters let a little loose by drinking some beer. But this seemed to have had the worst possible effect on the sober ogre. As a result of the beer, she ended up doing shady things to all the other sisters present at the festival. And this ogre girl is none other than Med. Now, we move back to the present where Med has sobered down and is feeling quite ashamed of what she has done to Scott. It turns out that she is a very different person when she is not drunk, and this surprises our hero. Calm explains to him that the tea from yesterday must have done its trick on Med, which is why she is sober right now. Even if this is the case, Scott still does not understand how Med got into his bed, and that too without any clothes on. Calm wonders if the Holy Father has done unholy things with Med in the night. But Bloomer says that Scott would never do such a thing. This is because she believes that she is now carrying our hero's baby. As expected, this leads to a hilarious encounter between Calm and Scott, who is accused to being a creepy scumbag. Of course, the Holy Father says that he has not done anything lewd with Bloomer, but Med cuts the both of them off by bowing down in disgrace. She sincerely apologizes for her actions yesterday and says that she has a bad habit of removing her clothes whenever she gets drunk. On top of that, she also happened to crawl into Scott's bed the previous night due to her intrusive thoughts. Med continues by saying she has done a lot of shameful acts despite being a sister of the church, so she requests to be punished, although we do not know what kind of punishment she is looking for. Scott takes a moment to digest this because he still can't believe that Med can be this way, especially after all that he has seen of her so far. Clearly, she is feeling bad about what has happened, so Scott tells her that there is a way to atone for her sins. This would be abstaining from alcohol, and our hero feels that if he can keep Med in check, then he can actually improve the reputation of the church. After all, the drunk sister is the main cause of disorder in the church, so it does look like a decent plan. Even Med seems to be hopeful of forgiveness after hearing this, but she already has a bottle of alcohol in her hand. Scott points out that the drunk sister is getting back to her ways already, and then he says it's time for a prayer. As he recites the holy words, he wonders if Med will actually follow his advice to give up alcohol. He needs to keep a close eye on her if she is to actually become sober 
because there's no telling where Med will get her next bottle of booze from. The drunk sister had gone around hiding bottles all around the church, so Scott has his work cut out for him. We see him throwing bottles away whenever he finds them, and he worries that even the farming fields may have some booze inside them. Calm reveals that she did find some alcohol and has disposed of it, so Scott is glad to hear that. Med is not to be found anywhere, so our hero asks where she is. Bloomer states that the drunk sister has gone to the garbage dump, but Scott wonders if there were any rotten vegetables to be thrown away. Bloomer states that Med had mentioned how even vegetables can turn to alcohol when fermented. And this is a red alert for Scott. He says that they need to get Med back as soon as possible, because if there is yeast and sugar, then alcohol can indeed be made. From the looks of it, Med seems to have been retrieved before she got to break her abstinence. But Scott laments that she is addicted to booze. At night, the drunk sister enters our hero's room and asks if he would like to have some tea and sweets. She admits that she was very rude today, and even among ogres, she is quite the drinker. It turns out that Med has been drinking every day ever since she was a little kid. She asks Scott if he would like milk and sugar in his tea, and he says no to it. The Holy Father then asks Med if ogres really do start drinking from the age of 10. However, it turns out that Med was drinking so much that her family had begged her to give up alcohol and enter the priesthood. This is quite shocking to our hero because ogres are known for drinking. For them to cast out one of their own due to excessive booze is quite the feat. Now, as she feasts on the sweets, Med reveals that she actually wants to quit drinking, although it may not seem that way right now. As a matter of fact, before she entered the talk of faith Med had fancied a human male. However, he did not want to get with her due to her horrid booze breath. This had seriously affected her confidence because she genuinely wanted humans to like her. Scott does not have anything to say to this, so the both of them continue to eat cookies and drink tea. The Holy Father states that he may not have known Med for long, but he has already seen her do some outrageous things. After all, this is the same woman who has turned goblins into vomit bags. Despite this, he finds the cookies that she has baked to be amazing. Scott believes that a woman who can bake such cookies can't possibly be a bad person, and it makes the drunk sister blush. She continues to drink more of the tea, but something seems to be happening to her as a result of it. As a matter of fact, she is suddenly infused with energy, although this is something that usually happens with alcohol. Now, Med crawls upon Scott in shady fashion, and she asks him that if she is not able to quit drinking, then would he still accept her? The Holy Father tries to resist the unholy temptation but it is of no good as the drunk sister attacks him with her lips and gains the upper hand. Scott tries once again to stop Med, but he is no match for an ogre. The funny thing is that Med is actually hugging Scott so hard that she is pretty much breaking his ribs. Our hero feels that he is going to pass away, but he luckily only passes out. As Med tries to figure out what has gone wrong, she realizes that the milk for the tea is actually milk liqueur. The drunk sister remembers that she had alcohol stashed away in this form as well, and she is proud of herself, even while Scott lies on the bed passed out from all the pain. Despite this lucky coincidence, she does admit that she has failed at quitting yet again. All of a sudden, Med loses control of her intrusive thoughts and locks lips with Bloomera just like she did with all those sisters when she got kicked out of church. Calm shows up and tells Med that she does not mind overlooking the excessive alcohol, but the drunk sister should at least avoid doing shady things with the other sisters in church. After all, if she gets it all mixed up and does the same shady things to a man, then it will be over for her. Med argues that such a thing won't happen, and she stops with Bloomera, allowing the naughty girl to breathe again. Calm asks her on what basis she is saying this and Med states that men only kiss the people they love. Due to that, she is all shiny and new from a technical standpoint. However, Bloomera tells her she reeks of booze and even Kelm sarcastically calls her a maiden. Med is upset to hear this, and she wonders what to do with her drunken self. 
Apparently, the best way for her to deal with such a situation is keep drinking until she forgets about it. Later on, Scott finally wakes up from the rib-crushing hug and wonders what happened to him. He does recall Med trying to get freaky with him, but when he opens his eyes, he sees the same monstrous ogre girl getting ready to do the unthinkable. Our hero is in total shock and dismay as he sees Med puking into his own mouth, just like she had done to the goblin earlier. It's a disgusting yet hilarious sight, and then Med is asked why she treats people this way by vomiting into their mouths. She states that it's simply to keep the floor clean, but that is not exactly how she should be operating. Anyway, Kaun thinks to herself that ever since the Holy Father has come to this church, the moral order has been shaken even more than what it was before. She can't allow this to go on any longer otherwise the Karma Church will be tainted forever. Keeping in mind all the shady things that Med has done to Scott, Kalm has decided to become the last line of defense, and she will keep the church in line. Some weird noises start coming from the church, and we can imagine what they might be, but Bloomer thinks that they are because of all the cats around the area. Now, in order to understand Kalm's story, we must go back to the time she was in a monastery. Kalm used to be a very strict sister, even though she eventually got a very lewd past as a succubus. In the beginning, she would never do anything shady and people would often forget that she was a succubus due to her lifestyle as a sister. One day, some men had entered the monastery, and this exception was granted in order to all them to repair the monastery. It was this very moment when Kalm's succubus instinct kicked in, because her body could sense the male body almost instantly. Since she was around a man after so long, Calm went haywire with her hormones and could not control herself. Eventually, she released tons of pheromones into the air, and this caused all the sisters of the church to turn into wild animals. This coupled with the bulky men, and what followed was a series of unspeakable acts that simply cannot be mentioned. Even though Calm is a maiden now, she ended up causing the lewdest thing to have ever happened inside a church. Back to the present, she laments how chaotic the church has become ever since Scott entered it. She lets him know what his presence has done to the order around here, and she makes a whole new set of rules for living inside the church. From this day onwards, everyone is to follow them without fail, but some of them are way too harsh for the unholy sisters. First of all, the sisters can't come close to Scott, which is something that Bloomera does not like at all. At the same time, Med is told to tightly button her clothes, but this will not be possible for her due to her extreme curviness and massively large pillows. While Med and Bloomera boo Calm for what she has done, Scott seems to be in favor of it as such rules will help the environment of the church. Our hero believes that such regulations will invite more believers to the church, so he would like to do his best together with Calm, for some reason. His words seem to have awakened Kalm's succubus instincts, and all she can think about is working with the Holy Father, whilst glowing with the energy of all her intrusive thoughts. The first rule is that men and women cannot have any form of physical contact, but Bloomera is not going to let such a thing stop her, so she acts as if she is falling down and asks Scott to catch her. However, Kalm catches her before she can fall on our hero, and she even commends the naughty girl for her acting. The Holy Father is glad to see how quick the succubus girl is to respond to such advances, and it gives him some kind of relief. In a last resort, Bloomer tries pinching certain areas of Calm's body, and it seems to awaken her intrusive thoughts. That's when she adds the rule where even girls can't touch each other in shady places. The next rule is that nobody can expose too much of their skin. But this is a problem for Med, whose pillows are bigger than her own head. She asks Kalm if she can let them breathe, but she is told to endure it. After all, even the succubus girl has to deal with such pain every day. Med argues that her clothes will burst open, even if she moves a little bit, so it would be better to just let it all out in the open. The drunk sister then goes to Kalm and tells her also to relax a bit, as it would be super comfy. The succubus girl tries her best to resist, and then Med wonders if her pillows could be even bigger than her own. Calm tries to stop her, 
but it is of no use as Med proceeds to feel her soft pillows. The drunk sister says that Calm has much softer pillows than her own which are actually a bit firm. The succubus girl asks Med not to please on her, but these talks seem to be awakening the Holy Father's unholy intentions. The next rule does state that lewd conversations are not allowed, so the girls need to be a bit more careful around Scott. Later on, our hero sits with Med and tries to figure why Calm is so against intrusive thoughts and shady acts. After all, succubus girls are said to enjoy such things and even get energy from them. That's when he wonders if Calm is the kind of succubus that acts in the same way as a human vegan. Such people are not of any value to society, but they still like to force their thoughts upon others regardless of logic. Suddenly, Bloomera enters the room and tells Scott that there is some trouble regarding Calm. Our hero wants to know what the issue is, but the naughty girl simply says that Calm is a succubus and super echi. Of course, this is supposed to be the norm, but when Scott checks it out, he can see that Calm has been in succubus mode for a while. It turns out that Bloomera was not messing around after all, and our hero agrees that he was feeling a bit off once he entered this room. Med then tells him that this could be happening because Calm has finally reached her limit. Scott does not understand what this means, so he learns that it's true what they say about succubi thriving by drawing in energy from shady acts. However, if a succubus is deprived of such things for a very long time, then her body will begin to crave them and emit pheromones to get others excited. Med then says that they will need to do something about Calm otherwise her pheromones will cause all of them to engage in shady activities. As a result, the Karma Church will be drenched in unholy fluids and nobody wants that to happen. There is cause for concern, because Kalm's sin was indeed doing the very same thing, which caused an entire monastery to fall apart. If this happens yet again, then it won't just be the Karma Church, but the nearby village as well. Scott finally understands the gravity of the situation, and realizes that he will need to do something about it fast. As our hero tries to think of a way out, the other unholy sisters start to imagine what will happen if Calm does unleash her pheromones. This seems to get them excited already, and Scott worries that they want to leave things be the way they are. Of course, Med and Bloomera tell him they want to help Calm, but we can all see that is not the case. The drunk sister asks Scott if there actually is a way to cure this problem, but the Holy Father doesn't know what to do, since unholy fluids are involved here. There seems to be no other way than to unleash his own elephant's water, and the unholy sisters decide to help him with it. Med sits him down and says that she will help him take it out since it is all for Calm's sake. Scott tries to stop her, but even Bloomera wants to see what will come out of his elephant as she does not know how such things work. Both the girls keep cheering on Scott, asking him to let it all out, and it does not look like the Holy Father will be able to escape this one. Soon enough, he gets up and walks into his room. Although Med and Bloomera don't know what he's up to, our hero is ready to risk it all, as long as it means he will get to save Calm from her current situation. With that, he drops his pants and asks God and the hero Taka for forgiveness as he is about to turn into a beast. However, at this very moment, someone enters the church and says sorry for turning up so late. It's a cowgirl and her name happens to be the spurt lady who comes to give energy to Calm. She notices that Scott is new around here and wonders if he is the new source of Calm's energy. The cow girl is actually jealous of Calm for feeding off the Holy Father, so she asks if she can also get some energy from him. She then reveals that she provides spurt moo to Calm, which is basically the unholy fluid of cows, although in this case, she must mean bulls and buffaloes. Scott has no idea what's going on over here. So the spurt lady explains that Calm is not really fond of human fluids, which is why she drinks the unholy liquids of cows to maintain her energy. It's basically an alternative for the succubus girl, and she sometimes gets it from horses as well. The real question though is how the spurt lady gains access to such liquids in the first place. Scott finally realizes the truth of the matter. But then he figures that Med and Bloomera should have been aware of it, 
if they were living with Kelm all this time. This means that they were tearing to trick him into offering his own elephant water. So he chases after them with disdain. Is buffalo water really going to end up saving Kelm? And for how long would our hero be able to repress himself while living with three unholy sisters? Like, share, and subscribe if you like this video and want to see more of the story unfold. If this video gets some love, then I'll upload part 2 as well. See you until next time then.